be in Galatians 5 this morning. Galatians chapter 5. We'll be reading verses 19 through 26 of Galatians chapter 5. The Word of God says this. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, as they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, um, you have made it so clear in your word, and unfortunately we have muddied the waters so often. Father, send your Holy Spirit to open our eyes that we might truly understand what we are reading and its implications for our lives, for our church, for our community. Father, if there is someone here who has not been born again by your Spirit, we pray that today you would awaken them and call them to yourself, that they would turn from their sin and turn from their self-righteousness and believe in Christ. Holy Spirit, speak, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. You can go ahead and be turning to Matthew 7, that's where we're going to begin today before we come back and end in Galatians. But if you have been with us uh, or have not been with us, I want to give kind of a short review of uh, where we are and where we're going. In the fall, we're going to be starting um, small groups that meet in homes and uh, all across the community. Um, some up as far as north as Jacksonville, also down as far south as Jonesville. And we see in Acts 2, that this is what the early church did. They met in homes. They met from house to house. And what we're doing this summer is we're looking at not what the early church did, but why they did it. Because we want to have an understanding of what the Christian life truly looks like. If you were with us the first week, we looked at what is Christianity. And we saw that Christianity is not just a religion, it's not just a belief system, it's not just a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's all of those things, but Christianity at its core is a new life, it is regeneration, it is the Spirit of God awakening someone and giving them a new life. And then we looked last week, we were, we were looking at, at what this new life looks like as it relates to baptism and being part of the body of Christ, and it's not just some religious externals when you're baptized, but that you are baptized into the body of Christ. And one of the things we're seeing continuously over and over and over again, that the nature of our salvation is not individualistic. Yes, you as an individual soul may be saved, but you are saved and made part of the body of Christ. And that's the focus that I want you to see continuously. It's not just Ephesians 2 that you are made alive. You are now made part of the body of Christ as you are made alive. As he tears down the wall between Jew and Gentile, slave and free, rich and poor, and makes one new man. As you are baptized, it's not just an individual profession of faith. What you are also expressing is that you are identifying with the body of Christ, not just in his death, burial, and resurrection, but as the body of Christ in this world, the church of Jesus Christ. Christ. Now, some of y'all have asked me a question, okay, and which means I'm very happy to hear this question because you're thinking, you're paying attention, you're thinking ahead, and, and, and that's what I want you to do. I want you to be meditating on Scripture and thinking ahead, and this is the question that you ask. Well, it's great that we're the body of Christ and we all have differences, um, but, but how do I know who truly is my brother or sister in Christ? Okay, it, 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 you know, yes, there are Presbyterians who are believers, and there's Methodists who are believers, and there's you know Episcopals that are believers. But how do I know who I'm supposed to be working with as the body of Christ that I have been baptized into? Well, this is not a a new question, 
And this is also not a question for which the word of God does not have an answer. In Matthew 7 and verse 15, Jesus tells us this. He says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. He says that there are going to be people who profess to be Christians, but they are not. Now it's interesting to note that their profession, they are so certain of their profession that if you read down in verses 21 and 22 and 23, they argue with Jesus on the day of judgment when he says they're not. They want to persuade Jesus that they are Christians because they are so persuaded themselves. Wolves are not going to be like when you confront them. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just pretending to be a Christian. <laughs> you caught me. No. They are utterly and totally convinced, so convinced that when they die and stand before God, they want to argue with Him that they are actually, in fact, His child. There are going to be people who claim to be Christians, and they're not. So how do we know who is my brother, who is my sister, who am I supposed to, to, to work with? I've been baptized in the body of Christ. Well, who are the hand, the feet? Who, who's the eyes? Who's the liver? I need to know these things. How am I going to find these things out? What well, Jesus tells us, verse 16, you will know them by their fruit. Now, if you go back to the first message we looked at in this, if you come from the, the basis that Christianity is a religion, you have probably heard Matthew 7 taught continuously and incessantly. Why? Because fruit is defined as religious externals. And so if you do not wear the right clothes, listen to the right type of music, do the right things, observe the right holidays, not observe the right holidays, that's how we know who's a Christian. You can look and see what a woman's wearing, and you can tell because the, the, what she's wearing, that's the fruit. Okay, well, but that, that's only if Christianity is a religion with man-made externals. If you, if you come from a, a, a church background where Christianity is a creed, it's can they sign this doctrinal statement? That's the fruit. But there's an important hermeneutic principle. Hermeneutic is just simply the way you interpret Scripture that you need to know, and that is to let the Bible interpret the Bible. Jesus has not left us in the dark what he means. He is incessantly telling us about you will know them, verse 20, you will know them by their fruits. What is he talking about? Is he talking about going and getting in the truck and turn on the radio and if it's rock music, that's the fruit? No, 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 that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is what we just read in Galatians chapter 5. So we're going to go to Galatians 5, and what we're going to look at is the marks of an unbeliever versus the marks of a believer. And it's interesting because he talks about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And we're going to go through and we're going to deal with some of the anomalies that take place within the Christian life at the end. But I want us to go and begin just by looking at the marks of of a wolf, the marks of someone who is a goat, the marks of someone who has not been born again, someone who does not have the new life of the Spirit of God, someone who has not been raised to walk in newness of life. Verse 19, the works of the flesh are manifest. That word manifest is very important. What it means is they will be visible. They will be seen. The Apostle Paul, in talking to Timothy about appointing elders, says something very interesting. He, he says that, that some people's sins are readily apparent. Okay, there are some people you can look at them and you go, eh, bad character, eh, they're, they're a wicked person, we don't want them in leadership within our church. But he then says something else. He said, but there are some whose sins follow after. Okay? In other words, you may have to watch them for years before you finally see the fangs come out. They're good at pretending they're good at hiding. This was the Pharisees in Jesus' day. The Pharisees were the Bible thumpers. The Pharisees were the righteous people. The Pharisees were the people who did everything right. They were the ones who were constantly arguing about theology. They were the ones who would answer every single Bible question. If you had Bible trivia, they always won. They were the people of the book. They knew the book inside and outside. But what began to happen 
is you can begin to see through the ministry of Jesus their anger, their hatred, their despising of God begin to show through. And so when he says the works of the flesh are manifest, what he means is you have to watch someone's life for a long period of time, many times before you see that they are a wolf in sheep's clothing. Sometimes it's not readily apparent. Now, what are the works of the flesh? Well, you could categorize them. The first couple is adultery, fornication. The word fornication there is pornania, from the English word pornography. That's literally what what is there. That is speaking of sexual morality. Uncleanness, they're speaking of sexual uncleanness. Lascivious just simply means unbridled sexual lust. Um, That's what it means. And so the first category here is sexual impurities, sexual sin. If you watch long enough someone who is not a believer in Jesus Christ, they will exhibit sexual impurities. You can see this in Romans 1. What is some of the marks of a society that has rejected God? What happens is you begin to have sexual immorality. You then begin to have lesbianism. You begin to have homosexuality. That's just what happens. And you can see this in people's lives. The sexual immorality will begin to come out. Next, idolatry and witchcraft. Now, idolatry and witchcraft would have been seen very clearly um, in certain cultures. In our culture today, it's still seen. Um, I know of members of Baptist churches who have practiced the occult, black magic, voodoo, okay? And you go, well, that's ridiculous. No, they, there are members of churches who claim to be Christians who still dabble in the occult, okay? That's, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we have one of the highest concentrations of Wiccans in Alachua County of anywhere in the state of Florida. The occult is very much present, and there are many professing Christians who still dabble in it. And notice I said professing Christians, Okay? Idolatry. Idolatry is, uh, yes, obviously bowing down to statues and stuff of that nature, but it's more than just bowing down to pictures and statues of deities. Many times the idolatry is living for self and that I am the one that I worship. Many times idolatry is greed. The scripture even tells us that, that covetousness or greed, the scripture says, which is idolatry that you are living for money. There are many people who go to churches and profess to be Christians, but they're there for business networking. That's just what it is. There are many pastors who preach for money. There are. They have private jets. You don't get that by preaching the gospel. You get that by using the people of God for money. That's idolatry. You go on. And the next is it deals with more relationships with other people. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions. We'll, we'll come back to heresies. Envies, murders. What you can see, if you want to see the works of the flesh, all you have to do is watch the way someone interacts with other people. By the way, how do you summarize the Ten Commandments? Love God and love your neighbor. If I want to know whether you're right with God, all I have to do is see how you treat other people who bear God's image. This is such a common thing within the Word of God that John, the apostle, tells us in 1 John, when talking about examining whether someone is a believer or not, he said, you can't say that you love God whom you have not seen when you hate your brother whom you have seen. Why? Because your brother bears the image of God. You cannot have hatred towards your fellow man and love towards God within the same heart. It does not work that way. That's why Jesus talks about that the one who will not forgive will not be forgiven. If you actually have a new heart, you're going to want to forgive the way that God has forgiven you. And so you can see that this this animosity and division towards other people so often churches are, you know, the, the Christian churches are, you know, all you Christians do is fight and split. No, wolves fight and in the fights and splits. Okay, that's what takes place. But when you're unconverted people, yeah, they may profess faith in Christ, but you don't look at their profession, you look at their flesh and their interaction. Uh, my batteries are dead. So, um, sorry about that. 
saw y'all back there trying to figure it out and I was trying to figure it out myself. But as it speaks of these things, what it's showing is a complete total lack of control. Okay? That your body is, is, is what dictates how you live and act your life. Thank you, Simon. And that's what it's speaking of here. That your flesh is what determines what is right and wrong for you. What feels good for you is what you do. Okay? These are marks of people who are not believers. But when you come to verse 22, he then gives us the fruit that Jesus is talking about. How will I recognize who's my brother and sister in Christ? Now, I, I don't want to like make fun of people, um, but <laughs> I was reading an article this morning. Um, as I was waiting for the kids to get ready for breakfast and all those things. I was reading an article, and it was, would you cooperate with this church? Um, and it talked about, well, the pastor went to a Southern Baptist seminary. Okay, well, the church has always been Southern Baptist. Well, they kind of agree with the Baptist faith in the message 2000. They have elders. And, and I'm sitting there going like, okay, all that you're describing means absolutely nothing to me. You know what I base cooperation on? The fruit of the Spirit. That's what you base it on. Okay? Not whether they sign a doctrinal statement. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Satan has better theology than you do. He's actually seen God. Okay? He actually knows about the Trinity. He's actually seen the Trinity. And he's still a devil. You can be part of the greatest denomination the world has ever seen and still be unconverted. You can sign every great doctrinal statement. You can recite the Apostles' Creed and go to hell. How do I know who's my brother or sister in Christ? Jesus told me. Look for the fruit. What fruit? What we're getting ready to look at. Piece by piece. Now, I want you to think of the fruit, and I want you to think of two questions here. One, do I, do you personally, exhibit this fruit in your life? But here's the second question. Is it possible to exhibit this fruit by yourself? Because one of the greatest errors that we're preaching against this summer that's going into why we want to have small groups that meet in homes is we've adopted a rugged individualism that I can be a mature Christian by myself. I don't need you. I don't need anyone else. All I need is me and the Holy Spirit and the Bible and Jesus. What I would argue as we look at these is that if you have the Bible and the Holy Spirit and Jesus, you will be living in Christian community. And you can't bear the fruit of the Spirit alone. The fruit can only be seen in relationship to other believers. What is the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. That's the first fruit of the Spirit. Please tell me how you can exhibit love for others if you're never around others. You can't. And this, by the way, is the defining characteristic of a believer. If you go and read 1 John, what is the defining characteristic of a believer? Love for the brethren. What is the new commandment that Jesus gave? That you love one another. That's what it's about, is loving other people. You cannot, hear me on this, show this fruit of the Spirit at home on the couch listening to a sermon. You can't. Let me go a step further. You also can't show that fruit of the Spirit in this building listening to a sermon. This fruit of the Spirit can only be seen as you live your life with other believers. The only way I will know that you're a loving person and the only way you know that I'm a loving person is to see me outside of the pulpit. I can preach a great message on love and have no love in my heart. The only way you can see this fruit is interacting with other people. And what is that? Okay. Well, it's, it's agape. It's a self-sacrificing self love where I'm more concerned about you and your well-being than I am myself and my convenience. This leads directly into what we're going to talk about next Sunday, which is hospitality. 
Okay? You can't love people if you don't like them being in your home. Okay? If you love people, you like them too. I know that there's kind of that, you know, well, I, I, I always love you, but I don't like you. People say that they're kids. That's nonsense. If you love people, you will welcome them into your life and into your home. Fruit of the Spirit, love. Joy. Now, joy is one that you could possibly have on your own. Okay, you can, you can be driving in the car by yourself and be filled with joy. Yes. But let me ask you, how on earth can I know that you're bearing that fruit of the Spirit if I never see that joy expressed out of your life? Well, I smile at church on Sunday. <laughs> Let me just tell you a little story. <laughs> okay? As a pastor, I, I learn a lot of things about people. And I keep those confidential. You're welcome to share those things with me. I will not share them with anyone. There was somebody that I was doing marriage counseling with one time. And... Um, Real jerk of a husband. Real jerk. And I saw them come to church, and they opened, he went and parked, and he got out, and he walked around, opened his wife's car door, held her hand, walked in, they sat down, he put his arm around her. After the service was over, they held hands, walked out, he opened the door, put his wife in the car, went around, got in, drove off. And you're like, man, look at that loving family. He cussed her like a dog all the way to church, pulled in the parking lot, stopped fuming, put on a smile, walked in holding her hand, put his arm around her. As soon as church was over, thanked me for the sermon, went back out and cussed her like a dog all the way home, yelling and screaming at her. Okay? You can't tell the fruit by seeing someone in this building. You know how you see joy? It's when you're sitting there eating dinner with someone and they talk about some great loss of a family member. But you can see the joy of the Lord through it. Where they talk about how they lost their job, but how good God has been to them and their family. The only way you see the joy of the Lord is by living with people in Christian community. Okay? That is how the fruit is seen. Peace. Well, you can have that inner peace that passes all understanding. Well, this does refer to that, but that's not exactly what it refers to here. The word peace here means to join. Okay? It means to join. Okay? It means to set at one again. The Bible speaks about how Jesus is our peace. Cool. Well, how is he our peace? Well, just our peace with God. No, he's also our peace with one another. Blessed are the peacemakers. This is not talking about just the, well, I'm all by myself and all the churches are filled with heretics, but I have peace with God. No, if you're a Christian, you'll have peace with other Christians as well. You will be at peace with them. And when conflict arises, you can't stand it. Why? Because the Spirit of God in you cannot be at, spirit, at odds with the Spirit of God in your brother. You realize that, right? That if you are my sister in Christ, what is indwelling you is indwelling me, and what's in you will not be at odds with what's in me. And my flesh and your flesh may be at odds, but the Spirit of God within us will not let us stay that way. Will force us to reconcile. Will force us, and people say, well, I just have a peace. No, you don't! If you're at odds with your brothers or sisters, you're lying to yourself. You're deceiving yourself. Christians want to be at peace with one another and will be at peace because Jesus Christ is our peace. This is what we go over in the Lord's Supper when we talk about the body of Christ. Because that's why Christ's body was broken is to make two at one again. That's the fruit of the Spirit. It's peace. How can you have that apart from Christian community? You can't. You cannot be at peace with the body if you're not part of the body. How can I know that you're my brother in Christ if I never see you interact with other people? The answer is I can't. It doesn't matter what clothes you wear or what movies you don't watch. The fruit of the Spirit is how I know who's my brother, who's my sister. Patience. Okay, please tell me how you can exhibit patience by yourself apart from Christian community. Now, I understand that God teaches us patience, 
But you know the way God teaches you patience? Other people. That's how he teaches you patience. Your spouse, your children, your parents, aggravating people in the church. You cannot display patience by yourself. The fruit of the Spirit requires you to be in Christian community. The next one, kindness, also translated as gentleness. The word in Greek literally means moral excellence and demeanor. Um, I want to spend a lot of time on this one, okay? Kindness and gentleness. There has been a, a swinging of the pendulum in my lifetime as it relates to Christianity. In about the 90s, with the seeker-friendly and the church growth movement, there was this big swing into God is love and we just want to be a lo loving church, okay? And then that, that, that's true. But love was defined as we're never going to talk about sin. We're not going to really be offensive to anyone. We're not ever going to address problems. We're just going to turn a blind eye to every single thing that's going on in our society, in our world, in people's lives, and we're just going to preach love, 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 love. Well, there are people who studied love and realized that's not love at all. It's not love to watch someone drive their car off a cliff, patting them on the back and cheering them on the whole way. That's not love. Love doesn't watch someone destroy themselves and destroy their family. Love does not give a drunk car keys. Love confronts the drunk and takes the car keys from them. That's what love does. But what has happened, especially in conservative circles, is we've swung the pendulum the other way. And now we say the most loving person is the person who's the biggest jerk because they have boldness to tell the truth. Listen, Jesus did make a whip. Jesus did call uh, Peter Satan. He did call the Pharisees twofold sons of hell. He did overthrow the, ta the tables in the temple. He did run out the money changers. But please hear me. One, you aren't Jesus. Two, Jesus did so with kindness and gentleness because that's the fruit of the Spirit. And one of the things that I've had to learn personally and I've had to correct a lot of brothers in Christ is I don't care if what you said is true. If it was not said with moral excellence, that's a fruit of the Spirit. If it was not said with kindness and gentleness, you're wrong. You can quote John 3.16 in a spirit that God despises. Don't believe me? Satan quoted scripture. He told the truth, right? Satan quoted scripture. Do you think God was up in heaven going, wow, he did something right for a change. Hey, guys, he might turn out to be the next Job. No. No, we have to tell people the truth. But if you look just a little bit further on in Galatians chapter 6, when it talks about confronting people in their sin, which is love, you know what he says how to do it? He says to do it in the spirit of meekness. Not in the spirit of harshness, which we're going to get to in just a little bit as it relates to the fruit of the Spirit. I remember uh, Paul Washer, and this is something I've had to repent of. Um, Paul Washer, one time when he was a young pastor, was preaching. An older pastor came up to him afterwards and said, you know, brother, I appreciate your zeal. But the word of God is not a whip that God has given you to whip his sheep. And that's something that I have to repent of. And I apologize to you all for because there's many times I have not preached the word in gentleness and kindness. There have been times when I have used the word of God as a whip. And that is not Christ-like at all. Should we tell the truth? Absolutely. But you know what we're commanded to do? To speak the truth in love. You can tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and you can either say it in a harsh and hateful manner, or you can say it in a demeanor of moral excellence. By the way, how can I see your kindness and gentleness if you are not part of a Christian community? This is a fruit that you may pat yourself on the back and say, I'm the most kind and gentle person the world has ever seen. But if you have not been around other people, we will never know whether you're kind and gentle, and neither will you. It's a fruit that requires other people to be displayed. 
The next fruit of the Spirit is goodness. This means virtue. Okay? It is possible to be a good, virtue-filled believer on your own without having any relationships. But one, how are people going to see it? And two, what type of goodness is it that doesn't relate to the people of God? What type of goodness is it that is not seen in goodness exhibited towards your fellow man? If you are a good, virtuous person, shouldn't that be seen in the way you treat widows and the poor? Isn't that what we're told pure religion is? Isn't that what James tells us? If you are truly a person of virtue, shouldn't that be seen in the way you treat your enemies? Shouldn't that be seen in the way you treat your family? Shouldn't that be seen in the way you treat your fellow man? How can you display the fruit of the Spirit that is goodness if you are not in community with other people? The answer is you can't. Okay? And, and, and what I'm trying to, to, to tear down is this rugged American individualism that we've called Christianity. That I don't need the people of God. I just need a good sermon and I can go live the Christian life. No, you can't. You can't. Christianity is more than a good sermon. It's so much more. It's life. It's living with other believers. You have to live the Christian life with other people. It's not just getting information disseminated to you. It's living with other people. Faithfulness or faith. The Greek word here simply means persuasion, moral conviction, credence. This is important. Constancy in profession, belief, fidelity. Now, this word can have two meanings as it relates to the fruit of the Spirit, and I believe they both are very valid. The first deals with doctrine and fidelity, being faithful to the Word of God. I think, unfortunately, we have, in our doctrinal arguments, gotten doctrine wrong as it relates to a fruit of the Spirit. I've had this conversation with several people. Um, I am 100%, 100% in favor of doctrine and theology. I mean, just last night in our family worship, we were helping the kids memorize the Apostles' Creed, okay? I, I, do, I do a catechism with my kids so they know doctrine, okay? I have a degree in theology. I've taught theology, okay? Degree, like, like theology is important. But here's what we can do. We can make adherence to a man-made creed the basis of fellowship or we can make submission to Jesus Christ and abiding in obedience to Him, faithfulness, fidelity, the condition of Christian fellowship. You see, one is, do you agree with this interpretation of Scripture? The other is, will you obey Jesus Christ and be faithful to His commands? And there's a world of difference. One of the things that we have done is we have refused to push people into rejection or submission to the commands of Jesus Christ. One of the reasons we have such a a wishy-washy Christianity all across the United States is because we do not take people and say, this is what Jesus Christ said. Will you do it? Yes or no. What we do is, well, here's a bunch of things. Can you agree to it? Do you believe in the Trinity? No. Here's the question. Do you believe what Jesus Christ has said when he says, I and the Father are one? Do you believe it? Will you be faithful to it? Will you abide by it? Or will you reject Jesus Christ? It is not a rejection of doctrine. It is rejection of the God who decreed and revealed himself to us in his word. There's a world of difference. You can accept the doctrine and reject the Savior. But if you are born again, you cannot reject what Jesus Christ says to you and commands you and has revealed Himself to be. That's the faith. That's the fruit of the Spirit. But it's not just faithfulness and fidelity to Jesus Christ and who He has revealed Himself to be. It is also faithfulness to the body of Christ and to brothers or sisters. Christians are faithful to one another. Want proof of that? They went out from us, 
because they were not of us. If they had been of us, they no doubt would have continued with us. What is a fruit of the Spirit? Faithfulness. You are faithful to the people of God. Oh, I didn't say it'd be easy. Anybody who's been faithful to their spouse knows that that was work. Okay? It, 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 again, we're not talking about ease here. What we're saying is this, is that the Spirit of God in me will not abandon the Spirit of God in you. The Spirit of God in me can't walk away from the Spirit of God in you. It can't. Yes, there may be times of division. I was reading in my devotions this morning about Barnabas and Paul and their division over John Mark. But guess what happened? They still remained faithful to one another. They reconciled to one another. And they, though they disagreed for a moment, what happened? They worked through it. Read Acts 15. The early church had a disagreement on circumcision. What did they do? They got together and they talked through it and they worked through it and they remained faithful to one another. What about Diotrephes, which we read about in Sunday school? He was the one that rejected the brethren. He was the one that wasn't faithful to the people of God. Why? I'll talk about envying later because he wanted a position. He wanted position and power and the praise of men. The next fruit of the Spirit is gentleness, also translated as meekness. The Greek word here is literally the word for humility. It's the exact same word that is used in Galatians 6, verse 1, where it says to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. The opposite of this is harshness. God's people are to be a humble, gentle, meek people. By the way, how can you display this fruit apart from Christian community? You can't. You can't. And I, and I hope you see a systematic understanding that if salvation is a new life that has reconciled me to God and others, and this new life means I'm baptized in the body of Christ, and this new life means I bear fruit, that it's going to all be the same picture that we're looking at. Every week when we look at it, it's the same thing. Okay? When we look at hospitality, it's going to be the same thing. The Christian life connects you to the body of Christ. And you cannot bear the fruit apart from the body of Christ. Self-control, temperance. This stands in direct opposition to unbridled sexual lust in verse 19. Okay, Yes, this is referring to self-control in more than just sexual areas. It refers to self-control even in things like drunkenness and the partying that we read in verse 21. But it means that a Christian is not controlled by their flesh. A Christian is controlled by the Spirit of God. How on earth can we see this self-control? How can we see whether someone has unbridled sexual lust if we lock them in a jail cell? You can never tell. Because there's no way that they can act it out. How can you see whether someone treats women with respect if they're not ever around women? There must be the body of Christ where we can see self-control. You know what? I can stand up here and talk about and preach against losing your temper. But you don't know what type of Christian I am? Come over to my house and one of your kids throw a baseball through the front window. Then you'll find out very quickly what type of Christian I really am. It's true. Will I control my temper? Will I apologize if I lose my temper? You only can see this fruit of the Spirit in relationship to other people. Now, if you're paying attention to this, you say, okay, but what about one-offs? Okay? Every Christian still sins. Uh, if, if you can read verses 19, 20, and 21 and say, well, I'm good, um, you're not good. <laughs> you are blind. Every single one of us has some of this flesh in us. Well, if you read the whole book of Galatians, you know what you find? is that our spirit has been made alive. We are now dwelt with the body of, with, with, with the, the, the spirit of Christ, but we still live in the flesh. So the question is not, does a Christian never sin? No, you're going to see that the flesh sometimes wins. What is the mark of a Christian? Well, he tells us in verse 24. We don't have to distinguish on that. We don't have to wonder. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections of and lust. If you are a Christian and you have a work of the flesh that surfaces, you know what you do? 
you confess it to God, you confess it to others, and you crucify it. I'll show you something really interesting, okay? I know that, that most of y'all probably don't have the good enough eyesight for this. But if you read, this will make a real good agreement when you join a church, okay? To do this, to confess my sin to God and fellow believers, to repent and seek help to put my sin to death. I mean, that would be a really good thing to agree with with other believers, don't you think? I need other believers to help me put my sin to death, to, to, to point out my sin. I'll confess it to them. I'll ask for their help. I'll pray with them. I'll encourage them as I seek to mortify my sin. A righteous man falls seven times and gets up again. The question is not whether Peter denied Christ. The question is, did re Peter repent and mortify that? Yes. How do we know? Because he went on to suffer and die for Christ. There are going to be Christians who exhibit sexual immorality from time to time, who cause divisions from time to time. But if you confront them, if you speak to them, they will confess their sin, they will repent of their sin, and they will seek help to crucify the flesh. So when you see someone, you go, oh, I see a work of the flesh in their life. Here is the question. If they're Christ... Do you see them actively seeking to crucify it? If they're a wolf in sheep's clothing, they will do nothing to diminish it. This has been something that has grieved me a lot about a lot of Christian people that I've talked to. They'll look at somebody who has forgiven someone and they'll go, well, I'm not like them. They're a much more forgiving person than I am. So repent. Repent. That's not a personality trait. It's a mark of being unregenerate. Well, you're just more patient than I am. Then you need to repent and crucify your flesh. Well, they're just more gentle and soft-spoken. Then repent. All of us are commanded to have our speech seasoned with salt. It's not a personality trait. It's either a work of the flesh or a fruit of the Spirit. And if it's a work of the flesh, you need to kill it. Well, you know, they just... They're so much better at controlling their temper than I am. Then repent. Crucify it. Get help. Ask for brothers or sisters to hold you accountable. Crucify the works of the flesh. Otherwise, you're in danger. Because if you have no desire to crucify your sexual immorality, to crucify the works of the flesh that are seen in your life, you're in danger of hearing, depart from me, I never knew you, and you can argue with Jesus all you want to. It won't matter. We crucify the flesh. But notice what he says in verse 25. How do we crucify the flesh? We live in the Spirit. This is what Larry was sharing about this morning. We walk in the Spirit. As we walk in the Spirit, we make no provision for the flesh. As the Spirit guides and dictates our life, then my flesh's desires diminish and are not the, the guiding force in my life. Verse 26 let us not be desirous of vainglory. You notice so many of the issues and the works of the flesh cause division in the church. You know why? Because we want esteem. We want glory for ourselves. We want people to see us, to recognize us, to think well of us. What was one of the things that Larry read this morning and John? What is the Spirit more properly? Who does the Spirit testify to? Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God that indwells you will not seek fame and fortune for you. It will not seek glory for you. The Spirit of God that indwells you will seek glory for Christ. And that's one of the great distinguishing marks between a brother and sister in Christ and someone who is a false professor. He goes on provoking one another. Are they promoting the unity of the body of Christ? Or are they provoking division within the body of Christ? Again, I don't know if you're aware of this. Sheep like peace and quiet. Wolves don't. It's just that simple. Okay? And one of the reasons that Christians have so many problems in their churches and this is just because they're Christians, okay? You know what a sheep wants to do? A sheep wants to be in a peaceful meadow with no predators, head down, eating grass, 
with no care in the world. And you know what happens when you have an ambitious wolf that comes into the congregation? The sheep are just like, I, I, I don't want problems. I just like peace. I, I, I'm just gentle. I'm meek. I, I, I'm not going to cause a problem in the church. I don't want to cause any division. And you know what happens is then the wolf begins to raise in the ranks of power and authority because that's what they want. And they will stir up whatever division or strife is necessary to get what they want. That's why we have to be as wise as serpents, not just as gentle as doves. We have to take this and begin to divide clearly who is my brother in Christ and who is not. That's what Christ has commanded us to do. And, and, and this is something we need to bear in mind. Again, I'm reading that article this morning, like, well, this church has always been a Southern Baptist church. I don't care. That doesn't mean they're my brother in Christ. Well, this, this church abides by this doctrinal confession. I really don't care. That doesn't mean they're my brother in Christ. You know what I've found? Some of the most godly people in Gainesville aren't Southern Baptist. And some of the most ungodly people in Gainesville are. And by the way, you could substitute Southern Baptist with Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Episcopal. You, you, you could go to whatever denomination, Assembly of God. You could throw whatever group in there you want to because that's not how the body of Christ is defined. It's defined by the new life of the Spirit that bears fruit. So what do we do with this? Well, I think it's pretty obvious when we talk about I'm part of the body of Christ and I've been baptized in the body of Christ and I need to cooperate with the body of Christ, this is how you know who's in the body of Christ. This is how you know. But here are the questions that I want us to really meditate on as we move forward for next week when we talk about hospitality. First, are you bearing the fruit of the Spirit? As we went through these fruits, are they things that you see in your life? If not, then you need to take some very serious inventory of whether you're a believer in Jesus Christ or not. There was a Puritan writer who said this. He said, if you had a guest in your home, eventually your neighbors would know it. They would see them in the yard. They would see them on the porch. They would see their face looking out the window. If the Spirit of God has come and made permanent residence within you, your neighbors will eventually see it. They will. The Holy Spirit will shine through you, and he will shine through with the fruit of the Spirit. If you look at your life and you say, I see the works of the flesh and I don't see the fruit of the Spirit, then turn from your sin. But I would also go a step further and say, turn from your self-righteousness. I would argue that it's self-righteousness that keeps most people away from Jesus far more than sin. By the way, self-righteousness is a sin. But what we do is we focus so much on our good things that we do that we ignore the works of the flesh and we ignore that we're not bearing fruit. One of the core tenets, according to Hebrews chapter 6 of the Christian faith, is repentance from dead works. If you do not see the fruit of the Spirit, then you need to turn from your dead works. You need to turn from your sin. And you need to believe in Jesus Christ who died on the cross to take away your sin and rose again from the dead to impart to you a new life. Lastly, if you're a Christian, here's the question that I want you to be thinking on as we move into the fall. Are you living in community with other believers so that we can all see each other's fruit? Are we just relying that your performance or my performance on Sunday morning is enough to know who's a good Christian? And if I watch you enough on Sunday morning, I'll know what type of Christian you are. Nothing can be farther from the truth. We are called to live in Christian community with one another. We're called to be in each other's homes, going from house to house. We're called to work together, to play together, to sing together, to worship together. And if you're not actively involved in the body of Christ, would you seek ways, seek ways to be actively involved with your brothers and sisters? Amen.